Good morning, welcome to Quick and Early Miracles. I was presenting, we were moving, I lost audio, and we're back. So I'm gonna start from the top in case you're only joining for the playback. And what we are talking about today, thanks for coming back, guys, is your point. And we are going to explore the point. Trina, thanks for letting me know. We're gonna explore the point from the idea of what it's not, which is how you might be interacting with your present moment. And um, if you were in the prior presentation, if there was anything that was like helpful to you, if you wanna drop it in the comments, um, I'll pick it up here and that will help me sort of coalesce myself. Um, so what I was talking about was in a lot of these broadcasts, mostly what we're dealing with is not the establishing of something. We're not creating anything. We're not creating faith. We're not creating um, happiness. We're not creating joy, peace, love, etc. We are only removing the things that are not that. And I used the example in an earlier broadcast of a golden Buddha statue who was hidden from being stolen by being covered with mud. And I also used the idea of the sun where it's always there, it's always gold, but sometimes you see mud, sometimes you see clouds. And we get ourselves all tizzed up about the mud and the clouds and thinking like, how will we create a sun? Where will I find happiness? What set of circumstances? What do I need to do professionally? How will I? No, 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 like you have, you are, that is your default. And what we're looking at in the series is one, the allowing of that awareness. And I've illustrated that through some kind of like, let's consider this and we'll do a little bit more of that today. Um, and uh, yes, period. So one way we take ourselves out of this awareness and out of this experience is by bringing or taking our attention away from the now. And you, I have the arrows pointing outward, so you could think about this as going, taking your mind into the past or into the future, or like around what other people are doing or what else you could be doing, or those arrows could also be coming this way because like in truth, you're not actually traveling to those places. You're bringing those people, you're bringing those ideas to here. And when you bring them into your now, so your moment, you own your moment, this is your prime real estate, this is where all your shit happens, this is your garden of Eden. Whatever you plant here grows. So if you're bringing in conversations with people you really don't like or even that you've never met, or if you're bringing in events from the past, you're taking them, you're taking these little arrow arms and you're folding them into the into your moment it's like inviting them over to your table or into your house that's so crazy right if you don't like them why would you do that if that event sucked or that possible future doesn't feel good to you why would you have it over why you know one of the things i see with clients and like i'd also noticed it myself at some point where let's say that you have a relationship that's a little frictiony you have the encounter with the individual not that comfortable you leave the encounter and you bring it with you you take it into your moment they're no longer physically in your present moment but because you're thinking about them and you're anticipating what it will be like the next time you see them or how those motherfuckers did that again like you bring them with you they're not even there they're not even there and so often what obscures our sun, what hides our feeling of being golden are these things that we bring into our present that we think we need to somehow control so that we feel this way. I was talking about one of the ways that we leave the moment is to try to figure out a set of circumstances that will make us happy later what am I supposed to be doing? What's my purpose? What, who is the best partner? Well, you leave here where this is because you think that you won't have that later, but no matter where you are, this goes with you. You know, um, thank you for that note, Trina. I was also talking about how this is true of faith and 
I'm blessed to do this work. And like, if I told you what I had to do to sit up here like this, besides a lot of stretching at the hips and knees, like you wouldn't even believe me. And one of the things, like what part of where, it's like, I'm telling you this stuff and I've witnessed it within myself. And sometimes I just hear things, but I also feel or think that we're only, thanks Dwayne, we are only expressions of states of consciousness. So when you tap into different um, states, you access what's available to them there. And an example of that would be they've done studies where they'll tell a child, pretend that you're Einstein or tell an adult and the adult's like, okay, or the child's like, okay. And then they take their test and they score higher than they usually would. Or if you're listening to autobiographies, the autobiography of Tesla, like I am right now, or if you read about Edison or different artists, they're like, it's not my idea. Like it just came to me. So with this work, what I think that I'm doing corresponds to like other teachers and there's a teacher, a channel I like named Paul Selig and I saw today on Instagram, he's releasing a new book and I scrolled through the quotes he had included from it and it's all the same shit. Like we're all talking about the same stuff and I think that's because this is what is being asked for by the collective and my point with his is he's talking about the importance of faith and if you are attempting to navigate your experience of life, if you're trying to generate feelings of safety through your mind, it's fucking impossible the more that this stuff moves. So if you've had a pretty consistent past, when you look into the future, you just take your little consistent path line, past line and you draw it through the moment and you toss it into the future and you're like, okay, cool. But if this is always moving and everything else is always moving, it's really hard to find a ground because you can't really tell which way is up or what's what. And so this, these concepts from my vantage point are incredibly useful as this landscape, like the world changes because your center is inside your sense of peace, safety, calm, like continuity. It is inside. And so with faith, I was explaining in an earlier broadcast that a lot of what you think you're doing in thinking you're not and what an illusion it is to even believe that you can understand the past. Good morning. So the past is behind you. You're like, well, look, that's done. Like I could see it. This happened. This happened. This happened. What you don't necessarily recognize at least readily is that the events that you recall from the past aren't all of them. Sure, they seem that way to you. And yet, if we're all sitting in this room together and something happens, we're all seeing and recording different events. Not only that, but the meaning that you apply to them. So let's say that you hear something drop and then you see something over there. You would likely think, well, this happened and then that happened. So these two things, because of this, that. Similarly, when you're looking at events in your past, you'll draw lines between things and say, because of this, this. And you'll make yourself fucking miserable about stuff that actually is not even related. You can't know. Nobody can know. The the complexity of events is mine. I had um, I had a best friend in high school who died in a car accident with her boyfriend, and it was after school. They were coming home after school, and you could say like, going back to like trying to control things. It's like, well, you know, this event caused this event. Well, was it that? Like all of these things, you cannot know what what's what. And so much of our personal past will come into our future, come into our present, because we want to understand it so that we don't do the same shit in the future or the same shit doesn't do us. Isn't that wild? You can't. And so where you actually can apply your attention in a thoughtful way, the garden, your garden of Eden, where you actually can grow things is littered. It's just got a bunch of junk in it. It's so silly. 
And yet these illusions, because of their familiarity, because of the way you hear people talk about information, seem real. For example, um, I've got, you probably have seen, if you're in my world, books and books and books and books and books. For a long time, what I had been reading was how to accomplish this thing, how to do that, very like all nonfiction. And some of that has stuff in it that is like, you can make a really great argument for anything. And because we're storytelling, it's like you follow the author's story and you say, oh yes, you're right. All of these things make that. I agree with you. I agree with the facts that you pulled together and the conclusion you made of the facts we both looked at, but there's so much more than that. And even in things more concrete, like math, science, like that shit's always moving too. It's always expanding. You can have a paradigm shift that takes everything that you thought you knew about how stuff is everything there's a quote i really like that's something around everything everybody was like 100 percent sure about like it, it changes it changes so what i'm telling you is that while we seem to exist on this like predictable data set where these things mean those things and this is that there's a lot more variability there which is to say, you really can't know, you can't use the past to predict the future. Yes, of course, there are patterns, there's harmony, there's rhythms, there's all of these things. If you're going back to the weather example, like if these things, then that, and yet if we zoom out even further, it seems like attention is creative. And so we're still playing a role in creating through our observance so it seems like we're observing a fact set the fact set is independent from us and yet through our attention it is thanks so much for letting me know kevin i lost audio in the last one does anybody else lose audio can you hear me anybody anybody okay so that brings me back to my point and this is a little finger, your point. It is incredibly helpful to have a kinesthetic, that means physical, thank you, Isaac, or body point. I don't know what's going on for you, Kevin. Loud and clear partner, Roger, Roger that. It is incredibly helpful to add something to your experience that's different than the loop that you're stuck in. And so if you are a audio-ish thinker, meaning you hear thoughts, then if you take a picture and you start to push a picture in your mind, for example, a few years ago, probably five now, when I first started using neuro-linguistic programming and developing mindfulness, I used to imagine a big ass school bus going through and hitting any recurring thought I didn't want to have. So just, or I imagined a suitcase that I would put the thing I knew I shouldn't be obsessing over, but I was, I'd put it in the suitcase and imagine putting the suitcase in a, in a lake. That's, um, that's a neuro-linguistic programming technique. There's a lot of stuff in that material from my vantage point that's very practical and actionable, like, re like relief right now. And the relief right now sometimes doesn't fit what we think should be. And so we don't see it because it's like, no, change is supposed to be hard. This should be challenging. If it's easy, is it worth it? And you don't see stuff that doesn't fit your, everything has to be hard for it to be good model. That was like, I can, I can subscribe to that. How was that? I went the long way here, I think, divinely. Nevertheless, my point is here, I'm suggesting adding a physical component to your mindfulness practice because it interrupts what's going on up here. So if you're thinking in images, if you're thinking in words, if you're hearing stuff and you use your hand, you use your body, you interrupt it in a new way. So I'm suggesting when you're in your moment, say, 
what's my point? What's my point? Or you could say like, I also went through a phase <laughs> of at pressing my button. I was like, okay, my I called it like this is like my my belly button, and I would touch my button to say like, okay, what's my intention here? Something that brings you to right now. So this would be a way for you to develop a consistent relationship with yourself and your body and your moment which will allow for you to access that which is always there faith confidence joy connection and you would do that by noticing when your mind is crawling time or and space or when you've invited things take those little arrow arms and you've brought things into your moment that don't feel good so you can think again of your moment like a garden or your house and you you're the bouncer at the door if you're having a, an image of somebody that you don't want to talk to later and you bring them into your moment you invited them into your house you have them you have them over they're not there of their own accord. And sometimes you might think to argue with me and say like, yeah, but I need to think about how I'm gonna get them to understand this later. Okay, great. If that's what you think, and then set a timer and sit down and actively think through it, you know? And, and then when it's not that, bounce them from the door, create a visual where you imagine taking them outside of your head and shutting the door. After my heart attack, I really learned this lesson, live for the moment, let go of negative things and don't sweat the details. Yeah, and that comes back to too, like what's your point? Well, a lot of the things that we're doing when we're not present is trying to, again, create circumstances where we think we might be later. So silly, right? At the expense of what's now. So if you can kind of spend some time, maybe you do this, you know, once a week for 20 minutes or every day for five and just say like, what's my point? Like, what is my point? What am I trying to do? And ultimately you'll find that what you're trying to do in all your circumstances is just to feel good, to feel excited about life, to feel able to be yourself, do your thing, maybe help other people live a good life. Like that's your point. And what I'm trying to emphasize is the illusion that the things create that experience when it's your relationship to the things. And I think in the other broadcast, uh, the one where I lost sound, not this one, I emphasize relativity, which is to say, let's say that you're used to having a full refrigerator and you never think about it. You just eat when you're hungry. You don't want to, like, it's not a thing. And let's say then there's something that happens and you don't have access to that. What before you weren't able to appreciate or celebrate because the context has changed, the information that's available relatively, you have a different experience then of the same thing. And we're used to in our culture of like, more 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 stuff 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 and so we don't really have like there's a lot that passes unnoticed unappreciated because it's always been there and that's to say too like when you're holding yourself apart from joy or confidence or forgiveness you usually just think that it'll be in that level next level of achievement or in that next milestone or that next thing or next relationship but just like you didn't think it was there before like you it doesn't it's the thing <laughs> it's the thing and when you have this connection to yourself fuck fuck if it isn't powerful because you don't compromise yourself to try to get it there isn't anybody selling anything like including love attention companionship you know, like nobody is selling anything that like you're good. Like if it takes away from this, like it's not for you. But if you're not connected to this yourself, you think like, okay, yeah, sure. Like 
I don't really like that or that doesn't really feel good to me. But if you think you can love me, if you can give me love, then I'll be a part of it. And is that really sustainable? And like, again, going back to like my massive overall point of points, what's my point? It's not circumstances, which is to say like, if you find yourself in what I just described, great, bless it. You can start wherever you are. It is not circumstances, it is, it's your relationship to them. If you're in a situation that feels stuck or tangly or wrong, love it. I can love it. You can choose whatever relationship you want to it. And if the relationship you choose is like, great, this must be a learning opportunity or I'll get to practice this or like, wow, the, the variability in life, your whole experience of it changes because you're no longer saying this is wrong. I think in the last broadcast or the one before I was saying that to turn your power on is the same to say yes to what is nothing, 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 yell it back, nothing, and your world has to change inside or outside for you to turn your power on. Let's say that you're having massive anxiety or you're super depressed or even like just angry at things you don't think you should be angry at. If you say yes to that experience, fuck yes, I'm anxious, fuck yes, I'm sad, then you turn your power back on. You're saying this is okay. You're achieving your point by being at peace with life. And that's how to tap into your ability to be focused because you're not scurrying away from it, which was another presentation I did. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Does anyone have any questions, comments, ideas before we close? So... I hit my target of five by five, 25 total presentations of these. I likely will keep doing more. Um, I am going to, I said in the last one, start to do, what's your scurry? <laughs> start to do, um, have some guests on the show. Isaac, who's in the audience right now, there he is. Um, he'll be with me Thursday evening and we'll be talking, um, I think with each person, to start, we're gonna see how it works. Um, we'll do one segment where it's like, hey, how did you become like you? Like, you know, I like this kind of process of shedding what's not you and stepping into your, your authenticity and your path and your awareness and being like who and how you are now. And then another segment or another episode where he'll talk about what he, is experiencing from his vantage point and how he's working with it because life is not like you know it seems or sounds and like I can't say what it is um and I certainly can't say that what I'm about to say is not what it is but it seems like a possibility that's available that maybe gets overlooked is this ability to have a really beautiful conversation with life where you guys are like arm in arm working each other to grow expand like this really beautiful collaboration and that's possible once you stop pushing against it or when you're not trying to live a life that's not yours so the people that I'll, I'll have on will likely be like in that vein because from my vantage point that is like truth like at least not false where there is there's more available interacting with life from that seat, from my vantage point, than the opposite, because otherwise you're just in fear. So to me, that's living in love, and I'm really excited. Um, I've been blessed to meet a lot of people over the years from my work um, and being out here on the gram, and just like in the wild too, who are really, you know, interesting, unique, beautiful souls like we all are. I guess. So I don't know if that's really helpful to add, but I'm, I'm just, I'm really excited about the people that I'm blessed to interact with and hopeful, helpful, excited. You might like, to, you might enjoy them as well. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. And if you were at the first presentation when I lost sound, I appreciate you rolling back to this one.